live from WXOU at Oakland University, it's the Joe Mo Show. Now, give it up for your host, Joe Mo Sherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Joe Mo Show, right here on 88.3 FM WXOU, Auburn Hills, Michigan, Oakland University, with all your wonderful station identification features. I am your host, Giovanni Mo Sherry, and the Joe Mo Show is your home for all Oakland University sports and beyond from 88.3 FM. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to help support the show. If you're not listening live on 88.3 FM right now, the podcast of the Joe Mo Show. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe and support the show, especially since now we are in the middle. We're now into, you know, one week into October of the fall 2024 semester, which means all the sports are going on and are in the thick of it for their seasons and especially those Horizon League seasons. So don't miss out on anything by subscribing and following The Joe Mo Show. You can find me on Instagram at the G-I-O-M-O Show, and you can find me on Twitter at G-I-O Mo Sherry W-X-O-U for all updates on the show, and you can use the hashtag the G-I-O-M-O Show to get involved and stay connected with your show and with with your host and for today's show we're gonna have the usual lineup and setup lions have a bye week this week so the nfl coverage will be a little bit lighter but we always started with the first half of the show being dedicated to the golden grizzlies and then we move on to the second half of the show where we talk more detroit lions and more of the nfl stuff we'll get into the joe mo show picks for this past week and how i did Pretty well in some of the tougher games, but not so well in the games that proved to be obvious after completion. But that is the rundown that we'll have for the show here today. And before we get too deep into it, I got to tell you guys to go and subscribe and to follow the radio station right here at WXOU. Specifically WXOU Sports, where we have all of... Our sports content dedicated to that YouTube channel where we have live audio broadcasts live streamed on YouTube as well as on 88.3 FM. We have interviews with athletes and coaches. We got highlights. We got more. So be sure to subscribe to the the excuse me to WXOU Sports on YouTube and also go and follow your radio station at WXOU Radio on Instagram and simply at WXOU on Twitter because this is is the greatest college radio station in the country. And now to get things started, we begin with some broader news when it comes to Oakland sports. This one doesn't quite fall into the category of volleyball or women's or men's soccer, which is our usual coverage, just in only that case because they're a little bit easier to follow and a little bit they come across a little bit easier over the voice. But Oakland announced their OU Prairie Farm Student Athletes of the Week, and it goes to men's golfer, it goes to Luke Kelly, and for women's swim and diver, it goes to Grace Albright. And I'm hoping it's pronounced the same as Yami Albright of men's cross country, but either way, Grace and Luke, congratulations on your performances this week, awarding you Oakland Athletes of the Week. But now let's focus into the volleyball segment of it, where some news was announced that Emily Wickman, who was last week's Oakland Women's Student Athlete of the Week, is now this week the Horizon League Player of the Week for her performance over the weekend hosting Robert Morris. So congratulations to the reigning Horizon League Defensive Player of the Year, Emily Wickman, on continuing to stack up the accolades for the following season, defending the DPOY campaign. But in other news for Oakland Volleyball, this weekend, this past weekend, marked their first Horizon League wins. And they didn't just get one, but they got two over the weekend over Robert Morris. And we'll get into the game details here. So the first game was a Dig for the Cure, which is their cancer awareness game where everyone's wearing pink. And they dig for the cure to raise awareness and funding for survivors and fighters of breast cancer. But they won the first game against Robert Morris in a clean sweep. A 3-0 game or 3-0 match was had. And we'll get into the score-by-score score here in just a second, opening up the box score. So the first set started with... Going into extra points, where the first one was not so easy, climbing all the way to the winner, getting 31 points. 
to win by two. Oakland would win a 31 to 29 to win by two in the first set. The second set would stay within regulation. Oakland winning at 25 to 21. And the third set would be the same. Oakland winning at 25 to 21. And that brings us now to the second one, that one being the following day this past Saturday for Faculty and Staff Appreciation Night. This one, in a similar vein as to the first set of the first match, this one went to five sets coming down to the wire. And we'll pull up the box score for that one as well. Forgive me, I thought I had this up already. As we scroll through GoldenGrizzlies.com, as you guys can do so as well to keep up to date with all things OU athletics. So the first set started with Oakland winning at 25 to 21, but Robert Morris would get their first set win of the weekend, winning the second set 25 to 18. But Oakland would flip the tables and get the 2-1 set lead with a dominant 25 to 14 win in set three. But Robert Morris would flip the tables on them once again. In a similar vein as the set three, set four would go to the Colonials 25 to 15, bringing it to set five, where this one would also go into extra points for win by two, but it wouldn't go farther than 15. Oakland would win set five, 16 to 14, to get the weekend sweep over the Robert Morris Colonials and to get their first wins of the Horizon League season. As we take a look now into the standings and into the uh, current record of the team, Oakland is now 2-3 and three in conference play and 6-11 and 11 overall, but that unfortunately puts them 8th place out of 10 in the Horizon League, and it's the overall record that's kind of holding them back into 8th place as there are 4 teams that are at the 2-3 and three conference record shared with Cleveland State, with Purdue-Fort Wayne, and with Robert Morris. But it's that overall record of 6-11 and 11 that's holding them back. For instance, Cleveland State, again with the same conference record, has an 11-5 and five overall record, keeping them at 5th place. So there's still a whole lot of volleyball left to play, and it's not, nothing to panic about. But that the tough non-league schedule that they played, uh, kind of holding them back in the early rankings right now. But not to fear, as the Golden Grizzlies will soon be here to get into the postseason, to get at least a sixth seed is what is required to do so. But I'm sure we will be able to do that. Again, a lot of volleyball left to play. And the most recent volleyball that is to be played is this weekend where they go on the road to face the Purdue-Fort Wayne Mastodons in the weekend series, or weekend I don't want to call it a doubleheader because it's not the same day, but it's two games, so it's not quite a series. So I'm caught in the middle of uh, the vocabulary here, but we'll just call it two matches against Purdue-Fort Wayne in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that being October 11th at 7 p.m. and October 12th at 2 p.m. So that now finishes up the volleyball segment. We'll head into now the women's soccer segment. But before we do so, I want to let you guys know about Jake's Takes. From Oakland University, men's basketball manager Jake Masucci, he brings you in-depth coverage of all professional sports, including interviews with athletes and coaches, both inside and outside of Oakland University. He is in the middle of his college coaches and athletes interview series that includes Oakland men's basketball player Baru Navalarua, assistant coach Bobby Naubert, and former Golden Grizzly, now Washington Husky Chris Conway. Subscribe to Jake's Takes and follow the show on Instagram at Jake's Takes. That's at Jake's Takes with a dot after the first K. And look for the yellow logo for Jake Masucci on Jake's Takes. So now let's get into women's soccer. So no big news for this week as only one match has been played for Oakland in conference play, or only one that happens to be in conference play. That was a tough one against the Purdue-Fort Wayne Mastodons at Fort Wayne where Oakland would fall 2-3 to three to the Mastodons where the, where the Mastodons had a lot more shots and opportunities on the net. Oakland having a similar amount but... A little bit less efficient in such, and I'll, and I'll stop. And I'll stop the assumptions here. We'll just give you the raw numbers. Where Oakland had 14 shots and Purdue Fort Wayne had 21, but when it came to the shots on goal, Purdue Fort Wayne had eight and Oakland had seven. So there were close in shots on goal, not so much in total shots. 
a three to two ratio to be exact for total shots. Everything else would go about even five saves for each corner kicks. Oakland favored eight to six fouls. Purdue for Wayne eight to seven in that, but otherwise it was a pretty even match statistically. And that's kind of all the input that I could give you guys for not having watched the entire match itself, because of course soccer is a lot more than the box score, a lot more nuance to the play on the pitch. But getting into the goals scored in the 14th minute, it would be Oakland to be the first to strike with Kimmy Liu, I believe, getting her first goal of the season. But Purdue Fort Wayne would match that in the 31st minute as Amanda Leonard, assisted by Chloe Mariotti. I I know you guys aren't too familiar with the names of the opposing players, but sometimes it just rolls off the tongue and I can pronounce the names well the first time, so I go for it. But then Purdue Fort Wayne would get their first lead of the match going up 2-1 to one in a 39th minute with Adriana Reiner scoring in that 39th minute. And then getting into the second half where Purdue Fort Wayne maintained a 2-1 to one lead, they would increase it to 3-1 to one in the 48th minute, just a few minutes out of halftime where Gigi Riccardi would score assisted by... Chloe Mariotti, who assisted the first goal as well. Oakland would attempt to get back into this one into the 81st minute is where Sarah Ivan Ivan Ditch, I think that one's Ivan Ditch, assisted by Kimmy Liu, who again scored the first goal for Oakland in the 81st minute to cut it down to two to three, but that would be the end of the scoring, freezing it and giving the win to Purdue Fort Wayne three to two. Three T O T W O. So the current record for the Golden Grizzlies women's soccer team this season, they stand at three nine and two overall, with a two and three record in conference. That for now is good enough for sixth place in the Horizon League. They are tied with six points with Youngstown State and Purdue Fort Wayne in the standings, where. Uh, Oakland's two and three in conference. Youngstown State also two and three, but Purdue Fort Wayne two and two in conference play. And and this season's a little bit farther ahead than the volleyball season is. But sixth place again, similar to volleyball, is the cutoff to get into the postseason. And not to remind everyone of the pain, I mentioned it last week in the show, but Oakland was one game away from getting into the postseason last season. But a final regular season match against Detroit Mercy was what kept them out. But speaking of Detroit Mercy, we'll go through the rest of the standings here. They stand atop the Horizon League. After five conference matches, they are undefeated 3-0-2 in conference play with 11 points. Standing above Milwaukee, the perennial Horizon League champion, perennial perennial Horizon League uh, juggernaut. They're just one point away with 10 in second place. They're also undefeated, but one tie separates them and the Titans. Robert Morris with eight points stands at third, and IU Indian North Northern Kentucky stand at fourth and fifth with seven points. So Detroit Mercy having a much better season than they did last year. So far this season, we'll see if Milwaukee can defend their Horizon League title by fighting off the Titans. But that one coming out of... You know, at least just judging by last season's standings, kind of out of left field, to use a baseball reference. But either way, Oakland at sixth place with their next game coming up being a home game. That coming this Sunday at 1 p.m. It is senior day against the Wright State Raiders at the Oakland soccer field, and it is also gold out which means to wear your gold out when you attend the game at the Oakland Soccer Field. Again, that is Sunday at 1 o'clock against the Wright State Raiders. And that will wrap up women's soccer for this week. And I want to give you one more read before we get into the men's soccer. I want to talk to you about Friday Night Grooves. Formerly, the Summer Sessions has now transitioned into Friday Night Groove, where you can find some of the best alternative music, soul, jazz, indie, and electronic. Hosted by DJ RBJ since 2011, he's got one of the best voices in the radio game, along with interviews and coverage of the, of the artists that he features on Friday Night Groove. That is Fridays at 8 p.m. right here on WXOU. Again, Fridays at 8 p.m. is Friday Night Groove on WXOU. And you can follow the show at Trill Gunderson. 
That's at T-R-I-L Gunderson on Instagram for all the latest on the show. And his website has more information, www.FridayNightGroove.com for Friday Night Grooves. Once again, Fridays at 8 p.m. on WXOU. So that now brings us to the men's soccer segment here. A game just wrapping up this Tuesday afternoon against DePaul, but one Horizon League game occurred before over the weekend on Saturday. Oakland would unfortunately, out of the two games, would not get a win. Milwaukee would win their game on Saturday 1-4. to four. And just wrapping up recently, losing to DePaul. Where is the score? Hold on, I just had it. DePaul defeating Oakland 1-3. to three. So a tough slump after their tie against IU Indy in the last game of September. And we'll go through the Milwaukee game as well as the DePaul game. But, of course, we focus more on the Horizon League games. But I'll, we'll give the DePaul uh, a little bit of attention here. But starting off with the Milwaukee game, Oakland would dominate the stat sheet by the tune of 29 shots taken to Milwaukee's 9. Nine shots on goal for Oakland, but Milwaukee would have four, and all four would go through. Once again, o- Oakland dominating in shots, 21-9. to nine. They had as many shots on goal as Milwaukee had throughout the entire match, but yet soccer is just weird sometimes where you can have all these shots and you can have all of these opportunities, but if none of them are quality or at least quality enough, it doesn't matter. The few opportunities that you give up to the other team – can sometimes be the ones that cost you the game. And when you look at it, it almost seems unfair. You know, I mean, just looking at it as a fan, like, come on, we did all this work and we have one goal to show for it. Meanwhile, they did less work, but got more efficiency out of it. You know, soccer is just like that sometimes, as unfortunate as it can be for the fans. Continuing into the stat sheet, Oakland didn't have any saves in this game, thus the four shots on goal going all through Milwaukee had eight saves throughout the match four in each half and Oakland would have 11 corner kicks to Milwaukee's two 11 to two in corner kicks as well which I I would imagine again I didn't watch the whole game but judging by the stat sheet that a lot of those corner kicks were resultant in some of the shots taken potentially shots on goal as well but Oakland unable to get any of them or to get all but one through I'll take you through the scoring here in the 19th minute, that's where Milwaukee got started with Mefsin Rota scoring to get the early lead. They would then double it in the 37th minute as Asher Ozuzu, Ozuzu, yeah, that's how you pronounce it, <laughs> scoring in the 37th minute. And it wasn't until midway through the second half in the 64th minute that Oakland would get on the board with Abdul Al Rashid scoring, assisted by Julian Kosler. Kanzler and Jack Klomperens. And as is is written, volley to far post off a through ball pass. To give more detail, thank you to goldengrizzes.com for that detail. Now cut it to two to one, but Oakland unable to get any of their other shots through. Meanwhile, Milwaukee in the 75th and 80th minute would get their lead even further, three to one and then four to one to round it out. Ryan Bergauer would score in the 75th, and Asher Ozuzu would, would grab a second goal in the 80th minute for a 1-4 to win over our Golden Grizzlies. And we'll take a look at the DePaul game here. I just had it. Take a look at the DePaul game here. I haven't looked at it. I'm just looking at it for the first time here. It would be DePaul that got the first two goals Wow, all of these came late as well. Looking at the timing, the first goal wasn't scored until the 79th minute by DePaul. They would score again in the 84th. These games only go to 90, by the way. In the 84th, they would score and go up two against uh, go up two to none. Oakland would then score in the 87th minute with three minutes left. Audrey Billos would score off of an assist from Francesco Mazzei. But then in the 80. Uh, eighth minute, just like a minute and a half later. Uh, no, it's, it's about exactly a minute later. DePaul would score again to get the 3-1 victory over Oakland. All those goals coming in the last 12 minutes of play. Wow, I didn't realize that. Looking at the stat sheet, it's about pretty even. DePaul, 14 shots to Oakland's 12. DePaul, 5 shots on goal to Oakland's 3. 
Everything else is just about even. But Oakland, in the last few minutes, unable to keep the lid on the jar for a 3-1 loss in Chicago. So, wish I had better news to report for the soccer team, but that's the news to be reported. Taking a look at their schedule, their next game will be a home one this weekend, Saturday at 2 p.m. against Purdue-Fort Wayne. Is that what the women's team is playing as well? Oh, no, I'm thinking of the volleyball team. Excuse me. But the men's soccer team, they will take on Purdue-Fort Wayne at home at the Oakland Soccer Field for Faculty Staff Appreciation Day. Again, that's October 12th, Saturday at 2 p.m., And now checking out the standings here, I I didn't look at them ahead of time because I knew they would change with the DePaul game, or at least for overall record's sake. So I'll pull up the current Horizon League standings. Remember, Oakland is the reigning Horizon League champions. They were a runner-up in the tournament, but they won the regular season. But so far, they are stuck in sixth place still with five points in conference play. With Northern Kentucky above them at fifth place with six points. Robert Morris and Wright State tied at 4th and 3rd with 7 points. I hope these numbers aren't too confusing to listen to only. but And then Green Bay, the reigning tournament champions, are tied with Purdue Fort Wayne with 9 conference points. So that sets up Saturday's match between Oakland and Purdue Fort Wayne at home to be a big one for the standings as the reigning regular season champs look to jump into the rankings here. I believe that this is a similar format where six where six teams get into uh, the tournament, much like the women's soccer and the uh, volleyball Horizon League tournaments go. I'll take a look here just to confirm. A look at last year's bracket. Loading up on HorizonLeague.com. That is correct. Only top six teams get into the postseason tournament for the Horizon League men's soccer. Yeah, so Oakland is now going to be hosting the tied for top team in the Horizon League to get a win and to get their three points. That would put them up near. That would put them up with Purdue, Fort Wayne, and Green Bay with nine conference points because Oakland would go from six, and the win would give them three to get them to nine. But you know, a tie would do you some good as well to get get you up near where Northern Kentucky is. But a win on Saturday would be huge for the standings in the Horizon League. And I'll take a look as to how much of the Horizon League we got left. We got one, two, three, four, or five Horizon League matches left, so the opportunities are starting to become slim, further increasing the significance and importance of that game against Purdue Fort Wayne. That's where the students, that's where the student section has got to get up and loud and proud to show why the home field advantage is real. Remember, the Oakland soccer field is awesome. It's got its own Twitter account. So make the Twitter account proud and show up and show out at the Oakland soccer field. I just love pointing that out whenever I get the chance to. (laughs) I still find that so funny. The Oakland soccer field follows me on Twitter. You believe that? I just love that little uh, detail. And finally, before we get into the NFL and before we get into the Detroit Lions segment of the Joe Mo Show here on WXOU, I want to tell you guys about our club sports. You can make sure to follow and keep up to date with all the club sports that we have here at Oakland University and to kind of repeat my spiel that I had last week and probably the week before. But the club sports scene here at Oakland is something that is, as soon as you look into it, you realize this is a fascinating a fascinating sports scene here with you know we we take a look at women's soccer women's lacrosse getting into the national tournament of club you know lacrosse and soccer club hockey specifically the D3 team was screwed out of last year's top 16 national tournament as well after being ranked top 16 throughout the throughout the season last year they weren't any lower than 16 but they never they didn't get into the top 16 tournament which was weird but you know, then we got club football. They're trying to bounce back after a rough season, trying to regain a Great Lakes Conference championship, of which they have six and two national titles. Like you dig into the world of Oakland club sports, and listen, this stuff is exciting too. But what these players don't have in common with the varsity athletes is that there is no scholarship, there is no NIL, and a lot of the times they have to 
put money forward out of their own pocket to fund for equipment and travel and you know all the logistics stuff that goes into running a sports team because that's what they do on top of being students on top of working they you know, you know like the football team and the hockey team they're throwing the pads on they're throwing the skates on they're practicing all the like you know this applies to all the sports as well but this is all going out of their own pocket and their own clock their own time and schedule and they're just as exciting of matches sometimes as the varsity ones. Nothing against the varsity ones, but th- they put a lot into their sports, and it would mean a lot to them, and it means a lot to us here at WXOU to see you guys go out and support your club sports. Football, soccer, lacrosse, rugby, uh, hockey, table tennis, flag football. They got eSports as well. This stuff is a very wild scene and if you want to learn more about it, the Joe Mo Show has interviews on WXOU Sports' YouTube channel with the director of club sports, uh, Kyle Reese. So, and I got a couple of them, um, a couple of interviews, one last year, one this past summer with Kyle as well. Be sure to go and check that out on WXOU Sports' YouTube channel. I had posted there because it was a little more related to Oakland University directly. Um, otherwise, all the interviews will be posted onto the Joe Mo Show's YouTube channel. Uh, for you guys to see. Most recently, I got Jeff Tungit. Recently, before that, I had Jeff Smith of Oakland Women's Basketball and Oakland Men's Basketball. I got interviews with athletes, other coaches, alumni. We got great interviews here on the Joe Mo Show in addition to the sports coverage that we have here each week, or we try to each week. So either way, that is all to say, check out the Club Sports, check out the Joe Mo Show YouTube channel, and check out the WXOU Sports YouTube channel as well. So that will wrap up our first half of the Joe Mo Show here, where we covered all of the Oakland sports news coming out for this week, with apologies to golf, with apologies to swim, with apologies to cross country, tennis, the other sports that I unfortunately um, had to prioritize lower in order to get the coverage in. I love all you guys. I love all the sports that you guys do, but there's, there's a limit to the amount of coverage that I can give here on the Joe Mo Show. But you can go and follow the accounts on Instagram and Twitter to get your updates on those Oakland varsity teams as well. So when we come back here on the Joe Mo Show, we'll talk about the state of the Detroit Lions through their bye week, what we got coming up here against the Cowboys, and we'll go into last week's Joe Mo Show picks. How did I do? Did I get the games right? Which ones did I get wrong? And we'll see what we got coming up next week on the show. So we'll take a quick break and get to the NFL here on WXOU. Before we get back to the show, let me tell you about Bart's Pizza. Bart Basilico reinvented his father's pizzeria business by putting it on wheels. I'm talking a pizza food truck, baby. Bart and his wife, Lauren, travel all around Metro Detroit, cooking up homemade pies made fresh to order in their four-layered pizza oven on wheels. You can find them on their website at eatbartspizza.com and Facebook and Instagram as well, at Bart's Pizza. His last name is literally Basil, so you know he knows what he's doing. Make sure to grab a cannoli as well while you're there. Bart's Pizza, it's too good. And welcome back, everybody, to the Joe Mo Show right here on 88.3 FM WXOU. If you are listening on 88.3 FM, you just got reminded with two PSAs in a row to go touch grass and to go see the forest, which I found insulting and hilarious and Honestly, I could I could touch some grass right now. I, I can I can use a little outdoorness. But if that's your reminder to go outside and feel the sun for the last time before it goes away forever, you could go ahead and do so. Go to cider mills, go outside, breathe that crisp fall air as it is undeniably fall. Although it's a bit warmer, more comfortable than usual, but it's fall, all right. And you could be sure by Halloween it's just gonna be the worst weather ever for being in a very thin, non thermodynamic, non thermo retaining costume. So we all have that to look forward to here in the fall. But what we also have looking forward to here in the fall, as well as more Oakland sports, is the rest of the NFL season. And that's my segue to get into the Lions part. To get into football therapy that I have here on the Joe Mo Show. I just keep forgetting to call it football therapy, but that's what we'll have here. Where we'll start it off, we'll start off the second half of the show with talking about the Lions in perspective of the bye week. We have the earliest bye week possible, and I want to have a little chat because I didn't. I, I missed the first few weeks of the, of the season in regards to talking about the Lions. I, I had a little bit chit, you know, you could call it chit chat here and there 
uh, towards the beginning of the season, but some scheduling interrupted the Joe Mo show. So I want to kind of bring us, you know, bring us to where we are now when it comes to the Lions. And we'll talk about the Joe Mo show picks as well. I did okay this week, but we could do better. So we'll start off with the Detroit Lions. So right now we're 3 1 after four weeks, which, if you're going quarter by quarter of the season, which is what I hear a lot of my uh, uh, you know, fellows in the media, you know, my, my, my people in the media. Um, the, the, it's a good judgment at the quarter poll to see what the team is all about, to see what we can do, see what we need to improve on. Four games in is usually a, a decent sample size. And overall, overarching, what I've seen from this team is it took a little bit to find who we were, again, to remind ourselves of who we were. It, it, it took a little bit getting out of the gate. Luckily, we were able to at least especially for the first two games of the season. That's where it was kind of rough. We were kind of, you know, relearning how to walk again. Uh, some of that can be attributed to players not playing in the preseason and not getting full game reps, even though the preseason isn't quite the same. It's closer to, to, than to practice. But some people can attribute that to being not seeing the field for a little while. Luckily, we were able to get the win against the Rams in overtime in a very – um, passionate, a very emotional game, at least for the audience. But it unfortunately kind of bit us when it came to the game against the Bucks. We couldn't do the playoff repeat sweep um, against the Rams and the Bucks. But you know, coming out one on one when you're looking a little rough, okay, that's that's not bad. And then to go across the country into the desert to face Arizona, a team that was looking threatening, a team that was. You know, not bad, and they're proving themselves to be not bad, uh, especially after the win over the 49ers. More on that in a little bit. But, you know, then you're 2-1, and one, and like, okay, we found it. The defense was really, really there. Offense was half and half, but you could tell it's like, okay, we can, we can still make it work. It's not what it was last year by the end of the year, but we can make it work. And then the game against the Seahawks, a game that I was very scared of being a cursed game, a cursed matchup, and it kind of proven to be that way, especially when you look at the sample size of just how high scoring and crazy those these games against the Seahawks have been in Detroit. It was so good to see us get back to form and to return to at least offensively what we have known the Lions to be in these past few years under Ben Johnson. So it feel it feels nice. It's like whew, okay, we didn't forget how to play offense with the most loaded with one of the most loaded rosters in the NFL. And now it hasn't been perfect. And of course, I'll talk about Jared Goff being perfect. Eighteen for eighteen is nuts. But overall, the four game sample size it hasn't been perfect, but it's been good enough for now. And especially with Jamison Williams. Becoming that threat that now defenses have to circle in addition to Amon Ross St. Brown in the receiving game. Laporta, sort of, but just not so much this season, whether it's for injury or for not. But either way, we got very two very good wide receivers. Personally, I would still like to see JMO with a little bit better, more solid hands, but we even learned like last offseason, like that that was kind of not his bread and butter, is like hand, you know, very handsy catching, which is concerning, of course, but it's something that can be worked around in this offense. And it the risk is worth the reward in that sense. Where all it takes is really one play, one bit of open space, one block down field that can just uncork. A touchdown, like immediately, like you have a touchdown now because you threw it to JMO in the right place at the right time, and he was able to outrun everybody. And he did so against the Seahawks. I was starting to get scared when he started to slow down, like way early, and the deep the Seahawks DBs were able to catch up, like at the last second. He was going to score anyway, but I was like, no, no, don't get cocky, please, just separate and continue to run. Don't, especially in that game, I was so nervous. Like, keep going, don't slow down. Ended up working. He dunked. It was awesome. Worth the fine, I would say. Um, I, I, I would say it's worth it, you know, because I'm, I'm the best judge of other people's money. 
Uh, but either way, I thought that I thought that was sweet. What JMO has become is, it, it, of course, ain't perfect and ain't quite Tyreek, but it is enough to be terrifying. And I'm kind of curious as t- is to whether or not that kind of comes at the cost of St. Brown and of Laporta, a little bit of Gibbs as well in the receiving game. And probably, mathematically, you can only throw the ball so many times. And against the Seahawks, you can only throw it 18 times. And, you know, it's going to have to be distributed a little bit differently if you have many weapons. Will Amon Ra get the 10 touchdowns, 1,500 yards, however many catches? Like, maybe not. But that's to the benefit of the rest of the team. That means other players are getting the ball. That means other players are doing well enough to deserve touches instead of St. Brown. You know, that's a good thing. I don't have any Lions players on any of my fantasy teams, so I'm not too concerned as to who gets the ball as long as the ball is moved forward by a Lions player. You know, so that's what I kind of like. I mean, one, that's kind of what I like about not having a Lions player on my fantasy team or prop bets for certain Lions players. I find that takes away from the enjoyment of the team. But either way, like I I see that as a good thing if, if St. Brown or Laporta doesn't get as many receptions as last season. That means other that means other players are good. Looking now to the running backs, th- like I was saying last week, it is it is the best case scenario when it comes to a two back running back room. Or when it comes to splitting carries with two running backs, that is the best case scenario. It's when you have either Gibbs or Montgomery, it comes at the cost of certain attributes and certain skills. Yes. But it doesn't come at the cost of quality. It doesn't come at the cost of threatness. New word. It doesn't come at the cost of effectiveness. Both of these running backs are some of the best running backs in the league. And they play on the same team with a great O-line. That is the best case scenario. So, you know, I, I kind of threw the question out last week. And you guys can let me know in the comments or on social media whether you like Gibbs or, Le- or uh, Montgomery better. It doesn't matter, to me at least. We got two great running backs that could two, that could do similar things. There's a lot of crossover into what they can do. But, of course, there's uh, other parts of that Venn diagram where other strengths are had in other spots. Montgomery, a lot bulkier, harder to take down, bigger, ru- I mean, kind of like a rougher and tougher power back, whereas Gibbs is a much more of the speed, explosive, finesse type of back. They can both run between the tackles, and they can both catch it out of the backfield. Of course, Gibbs is a little bit better at that than Montgomery, but I mean that's that's where that kind of overlap comes in. Some are better at things, some are worse, but they can both do the same things. It's not like Swift that we had previously, where it is impossible for him to run it between the tackles, or or like Jamal Williams, where it's impossible for him to catch out of the backfield. You, with both of those backs, you have all of your options still available, enough to surprise the opponent. That is awesome. I love this running back room. And I loved, I can't remember if it was the Seahawks game. I think it was the Seahawks game where um, they just, they were in the end zone. I think it was after Montgomery scored his touchdown. Gibbs scored his uh, second touchdown. And they just had a big hug in the end zone. Like a, like a, they had a bro hug in the end zone saying like, oh, we don't care. So who gets more carries? You know, we're just happy to be the best running back room in the league. I love that. That's what I took from that hug. I mean, it's a celebration. Can't read too much into it, but I, I, that's the vibe I got from it. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I want to flip it now over to the defensive side. We kind of talked about the passing game. We talked about the running game. I want to talk about the defense as well. Stopping the run is still the Lions' greatest strength on defense. It is... I, I, know, I know... I say that knowing uh, Kenneth Walker walked over us. He tends to do that. I love me some Kenneth Walker. Like he, he's he's a bad mf'er. To say it in a radio sense, to, to say it in a radio appropriate way. But he, but he's a bad mother scratcher. So to give up, I think he had like one twenty yards. I don't have numbers in front of me, by the way. I just I think he had like one twenty yards or something. It was very easy for him to get the edge. But otherwise, Lions run defense is fantastic. So I'm not worried about that, especially with DJ Reader being added into this. Now I I haven't quite 
I'm not a 20, all 22 guy. I don't break down film. You know, I, it, it, it's not my bag, baby. I talk over, I talk about vibes, which is my way of saying I am too lazy to research too deeply into this. And this is more of a fan's perspective of it. I'll, I'll take it behind the curtain a little bit. I, I, I'm not an all 22 dude, or I'm, I'm not the, the biggest football machine of knowledge. However you want to phrase it, but I got the mic here. I got the microphone here, so <laughs> we're going to talk about it. But I haven't. I, I, all, I say all that to say that like, I, I don't know specifically if DJ Reader's impact is that pronounced yet. I know that you know his, you know him on the Bengals helped Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard become fantastic edge rushers, and you know I, I haven't looked at it specifically, but has that happened for Hutchinson? You know, with him leading the league in pressures, like 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 now we're getting to Hutchinson, to just like leaps and bounds lead the league in pressures and by a slimmer margin lead the league in sacks at least as of week four I think I don't I don't I mean with the bye week that's going to shift things a little bit but six and a half sacks through four games is awesome six and a half games and and some people could say that you know they were against backups. Why'd you put backups out there if they couldn't defend Hutchinson? You know what I mean? Like that, I, I I can understand that in terms of context, and we'll see how it plays out throughout the rest of the season. But if you are a great dominant edge rusher, to where some analysts and former players and professionals are claim or using his name in, in JJ Watts in the same sentence, then yeah, you should dominate and destroy these backup tackles. He's done that for the most part. Six and a half sacks speaks for itself. Three of them coming in the first half against the Bucks. That was awesome. And he's having a hell of a season. He's having a season that we expected, wanted, and got, or have gotten so far. You wish that, I mean, Marcus Davenport had a little bit of a better health and in his ability, excuse me, to kind of bookend that, but still Hutchinson is doing well. And it's still something to where He's drawing much of the attention of the opposing offense. That's a great thing to have. And I'm very, very happy with the performance that he's been having so far. And I want to kind of make another note on the J.J. Watt comparison. Of course, it's early. And of course, that is a huge, huge statement. Because that is comparing Hutchinson to the one of the best defensive players in the modern era. Or in our... In, our century, we'll say. It's Aaron Donald's included in that as well. But J.J. Watt is historically a historic player. And to compare Hutchinson to that is a lot. However, you guys remember uh, when we referred to him as J.J. Swat? And he would catch interceptions. And, you know, he, he would catch touchdowns in you know on offense. Hutchinson's got the interceptions so far. I... He's a big dude. I don't see him catching a touchdown on offense out of the realm of possibility. I at least can see them throwing him on offense as a decoy. And maybe it becomes a much trickier play. I don't put that past Ben Johnson. I think he can make it work. And I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that. If not this year, the next. Because, I mean... A, a Hutchinson offensive touchdown prediction. Let's give it a big timetable. Let's let this thing. Let's give this thing a real chance to do it. I'm not saying it's going to happen against the Cowboys. I am more inclined to say that either Dan Skipper or, or Taylor Decker could catch a touchdown in Dallas for revenge. I would say that's more likely than Hutchinson. But either way, I I could see that in Hutchinson's future. I can crystal ball that. I could see that if it's wild enough of a game and. Maybe there's a bit of cushion uh, in the in the score. So all that to say that I'm really digging Hutchinson. Pass defense is better. Penalties are not. But it's still a major improvement over the 31st ranked pass defense in the NFL last year. I, I, something like that. By, by some metric, they were one of the worst pass defenses. So it is better. It's not perfect. We've gone against very good receivers uh, this season when you talk about at least for one half, he had a cup of Nakua against the Rams, Evans and Godwin against the Bucks, yeah, Marvin Harrison against the Cardinals, and 
DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith, and Jigba against the Seahawks. Those are very good receivers. I'm not expecting complete shutdown. I'm not expecting there to be multiple Darrell Reeveses out there. And that kind of like brings a question to me as to how good does the pass defense have to be for us to not immediately hate Aaron Glenn and not immediately think that we're going back to last year's pass defense. Like how good do does Carlton Davis and Amik Robertson and Terry on Arnold and like how good do those guys have to be to shed last year's identity? Let let me know in, in the comments or on social media. I'm I'm curious because I think the bar for us, because we've just been burned on it so often in the past few years under Dan Campbell, that it's you know it's going to be hard to shake that. And I mean, you know, what do we have to hold them under 100 yards passing? That's impossible. Are we going to have to give up no touchdowns passing? That's nearly impossible. So I'm curious as to where you guys put the benchmark as to what is good enough of a pass defense. What what is good enough for a total defense? You know, I'm curious to see what you guys think. And now that wraps up the Detroit Lions segment. We will get into the Joe Mo Show picks from last week. I released I released these on social media on the Joe Mo Show's Instagram page at the G I O M O Show. I also released it on Twitter at G I O Mo Sherry W X O U. So I, re- I released those Thursday before the Thursday night game, and I released them Saturday before all the Sundays and Monday games. So you can follow on social media to get what those picks are. On the show, I will kind of review and give my rationale and thoughts on the games that were had and whether I got them right or wrong. So we'll start with Thursday night. I had a feeling the Falcons would have it, only because they're at home. You know, you kind of felt like they were improving enough, and the Bucks, you know... I love the Bucks, but you know that, that's a tough division, and I've had a feeling that all that offensive talent would somehow wake up for Atlanta, and boy, did it. I watched up until overtime kicked in, to which I fell asleep, old man fashion, and did not watch the rest of overtime. I wish I did, because that was awesome. So I got the Falcons correct as they won 36-30 to over the Bucks. I thought the Jets were going to be able to get this one in London against the Vikings. And I'll talk about Rob Sala in a second. But I, I just had a feeling that in, in a nasty game, because I, I don't imagine those London games ever being good games. Crisp offensive performances. I, like, I don't expect that. And I expected the team that is used to playing a cruddy offense and playing more to their defense, I thought they would have a better advantage and a better shot in that game against the Vikings. But the Vikings are still undefeated and very much scary in the division. I picked the Jets. I got it wrong. So now I'm one on one in the week. Rob Sala getting fired is hilarious dysfunction. And whatever, I'm recording this on Tuesday night, or we're live here on Tuesday night on 88.3 FM. I guarantee that Rodgers will deny having any involvement with the firing of Robert Sala. You can wipe my behind with that. I think that's a load of crap. I see Aaron Rodgers, a player that I I can't stand, a player that is condescending to everybody he speaks to and the way that he speaks. I, he's like, and and this is funny because he was almost a vice president of RFK. I think it was RFK, but he is like a politician. He gives the right answers and, you know, he's not going to say anything bad about the coaching staff, even though that you know that he hated him and you know that he absolutely diva out of his mind and got him fired. But he won't say that on McAfee. You know, he didn't have any involvement. His name never came up with him and in uh, Woody Harrelson or whoever owns the Jets, Woody something. And, you know, he's just going to be the nice guy and he wants to move forward and he wants to play GM and get Devontae Adams on the Jets. It's a load of crap. This dude came into an organization, ordered ordered certain roster moves to be made, basically ordered his fake OC to be part of the coaching staff, 
and just nuked the Jets, who have a great roster otherwise. He is toxic. And I believe it in my bones that he got Salah fired. Now, was Salah a fantastic head coach? No. His defense was very good as a defensive coordinator of the previous Super Bowl. Not not this most recent, but the one before. Super Bowl 49ers team. But on offense, it just couldn't happen. It didn't happen. But what I do find funny is thinking and relating this back to the Detroit Lions. And I'll finish this up and I'll get moving here as we're running out of time. But I find it kind of funny that I was I was more in favor of having Rob Sala as our head coach after we fired Patricia than Dan Campbell. Because he's from Deer, because Salah's from Dearborn. I like the feistiness. I love the fire on the sideline when he was with the 49ers. But we ended up getting more of that with Dan Campbell. And just how funny those rebuilds have been. It's kind of happening at the same time, too. Poverty franchises getting new head coaches with a lot of hope in the same season. Almost came true for the Jets. Not really. And the Lions would skyrocket. So I find that funny. And Aaron Rodgers absolutely got his coach fired. As if that's beneath him. Let's think of it that way. As if he wouldn't do that. I find that ridiculous. Anyway, Bears and Panthers. I got that pick correct. As I thought the Bears were starting to figure things out. Caleb Williams is getting better every game. Which is why I'm nervous that we're playing them later in this. The Lions are playing the Bears later in the season. But I got the Bears pick correct. Ravens and Bengals, that one was a coin flip. I got lucky. I said the Ravens just because I I believed it more that the Ravens had figured it out and the Bengals are toast. I found that to be more believable than you know the, the Bengals being able to overcome a dominant team with no defense. And also the Ravens have like beaten the Bengals a lot re- in recent years. I think they're like 9 and 1 against the Bengals in those most recent matchups. So, I went with the trend there. Houston and Buffalo, I kind of found that as a coin flip as well. It's two very good AFC teams, and I just kind of got lucky with the last second uh, or last drive debacle on the Bills' side in a game-winning field goal for the Texans. Colts and Jaguars, this one I knew would happen because the Colts have not won in Jacksonville in 10 years. I went only on that, and I got it right. I'm so happy about it. That doesn't mean the Jaguars are good. Dolphins and Patriots, I thought the Patriots would be able to kind of take advantage of a very injured Dolphins team. Uh, it ended up being the ugliest game you've ever seen, 15-10 to 10 in the final score, and I got that one wrong. Uh, Commanders and Browns, the Browns, much like or in a much different fashion than the Bengals, are similarly on fire. And I don't see a way out for the Browns, unfortunately. Um, listen, you know I'm a big Baker guy. I love Baker. You screwed him over in order to get to Sean Watson. Sorry. That's the decision you made as an organization. And I feel bad for Stefanski. I feel bad for Garrett or Miles Garrett. I mean, in that defense. The, the, I feel bad for the parties that were not involved in, in Watson becoming a Brown. Um, but that, that just sucks. I really thought the Browns were going to come back as well. I thought the Lions, the Browns, and the Jets... Terrible franchises. We're going to have like a resurgence in this uh, in the past few years, but has not come to be. But I got that game right because the commanders are awesome. Uh, Raiders and Broncos. I don't know if the Broncos are good or not, but apparently the Raiders are not good because they're about to lose Devontae Adams. Uh, Max Crosby is still hurt. Um, and, and yeah, I just kind of got that one way wrong. Uh, 49ers and Cardinals. I had a feeling... The spread was seven. I don't. Know, I'm starting to uh, get my toes wet in the betting scene. In the in the betting scene, I would only if it's my preference. I would only do money lines because I just want one team to win versus one team to lose. I don't like getting specific as to how it happens, and you just don't enjoy the game. But I had a feeling with the spread being seven, it's like no way the Cardinals in a division game, even in San Francisco, they're not that bad to be down a touchdown against a a struggling and injured 49ers team. They would end up winning the game by one. I still picked the Niners because I thought it'd be at least close, but I didn't expect the Cardinals to go all the way and win it. But I got that one wrong. Packers and Rams. Rams are just way too injured for me to pick them to win anything. I picked the Packers and they got it. 
Seahawks and Giants. I thought the Giants were uh, unsavable, but the theory of the Lions beating up on teams so bad that they lose twice, not a bad theory so far. But I got that wrong. I picked the Seahawks, and that was not the case. Uh, checking out the other games, um, I got the Steelers and Cowboys wrong uh, because I, I picked the Steelers because I thought, like, uh, at home, defense, Cowboys, you know, can be had on if the defense holds their offense back, then I think they can have it. But, again, a last-minute, last-second play ended up being the winner. And Chiefs and Saints, I picked the Chiefs because they are – uh, Satan, they are the worst thing to happen to the league since the Patriots dynasty. And it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if there's interceptions. It doesn't matter if players go down. They just are able to win anyway. And it takes all of the fun out of watching any of their games. I only watched a few of it, or a few minutes of it, and disliked what I saw. And yeah, I mean, I didn't even see the final score. I just knew the Chiefs were going to win because they ruin the fun of picking games and suspense as to who was going to win. They rob everybody of that. And it's my theory on why I hate winners. And until the Chiefs lose and until the Chiefs finally come back to earth and face the same consequences as every other team has to face in regards to injuries and penalties and misfortune, until they come down from, from outer space, I will hate the Chiefs. And I look forward to their most recent, to a recent loss. So that was my kind of blitz through this past week of games. How did I do? I'm glad you asked. Or hold on, let let me look here at my standings. Because I don't think I got a final number as to what I got right or wrong. So out of 14 games, your host, Giovanni Mosheri, got 8 of 14 correct. Not the same as the 11 that I got last week. Out of 11 out of 16. But you win some, you lose some. I am 21st out of like 42. I, I'm exactly midway through or middle of the pack between this big old Pickham's pool. And I'm happy to be there and happy to continue to climb the ranks. So that wraps up and finalizes the Joe Mo Show. I know I say I would get into my thoughts on the Lions and Cowboys, but we're running out of time here on 88.3 FM WXOU. This has been the Joe Mo Show, your home for all things sports, your home for all Oakland sports, as well as coverage of the NFL. We'll see you next week here on the Joe Mo Show. It won't be live here on Tuesday as I got a gig next Tuesday night, but be sure to stay up to date. Subscribe on YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Support the show all the ways that you can. And I will see you guys next week from WXOU. This has been the Joe Mo Show.